if you were to have a VC, and any, any VC would tell you that, that they were not successful because they invested in Airbnb. They were successful because they invested in a hundred other startups that nobody has any clue what they're called, yeah. but they return a good and consistent 5x, 10x, 7x, 3x. Yeah. For, forget forget the, the 20, 50x thing, because first of all, you are not set up as an organization to do that. Yeah, you don't have okay. the governance. You don't have the people. You don't have the culture. You don't have the motivation to do it. People don't have the motivation to, to pursue endeavors like those. So not even VCs are, are doing it. Why would you want to do it when right, you have a, right. a poor business to run on top? You should do innovation, but you should be pragmatic about your investment and investment yeah. strategy and innovation. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Innovation Talks. Join us weekly as we discuss with distinguished industry guests how to refine and improve corporate innovation and new product development. Hosted by Paul Heller, Sophion Chief Evangelist. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us again. I hope you're all having a, a good week and the winter months are treating you well if you're in that part of the, of the globe. Today, my guest is, is Dan Toma. And Dan is uh, his company is called Outcome, which I think is a really cool name. And uh, he's also had his co-authorship on a couple of books that we've spoken about on this podcast previously. And he's just really active in a lot of corporations that are trying to do more innovative type of innovation. I guess you could say. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, where are you joining us from today? Barcelona. Barcelona. That's neat. you're the first person in Spain that I've ever had on the podcast. So this is exciting for me. I moved recently. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> and what's it like? Do you have, what, what's the definition of winter in Barcelona? Well, actually in the city is pretty nice. So it was just uh, yesterday I was, I was taking a walk with my girlfriend and we realized that spring is actually here. It's about 18 Celsius uh, in okay. the sun. Yes, yeah, in the shade, it is chilly. Uh -huh. But the cool part about the city is that it's just two hours drive from the mountains, and uh, I'm actually heading skiing this coming weekend. Oh, wow. Nice. You can ski, and then uh, a couple hours later, you can be out sitting in the T-shirt if you want. Exactly. Indeed. <laughs> indeed. Sounds like paradise. <laughs> almost. Almost. I'm just wondering why I haven't moved here earlier. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey Dan, uh, tell us about yourself and Outcome and how you created Outcome. Outcome is a partnership that I have uh, with uh, somebody. Again, you can you might consider getting on the podcast, Chris Beswick. Uh, he's uh, he's a culture expert, culture and leadership expert. He wrote a very popular book about building a culture of innovation. The thing about it is that he's the exact opposite of what I am, and expertise-wise, at least. If I'm looking at uh, at innovation from a perspective of systems and building a system and strategy and all those things, numbers in particular, Chris comes at it from the perspective of let's build a culture of innovation, let's train leadership on how to lead for innovation. So we're essentially the yin and yang, if you want. And I don't want to advertise on your show, but we're one of the few groups that actually covers both. You might have people that are super strong on culture, and then you might have people that are super strong on, on process and numbers. I think we do a decent job at both. And again, yeah. hopefully this doesn't come across as self-promotion. No, I don't think so. I mean, the listeners, we want to know who's out there, what they're doing, how they approach it. Uh, some may reach out to you, and that's, that's a great thing. I mean, that's, that's perfect. How did you get started in innovation? By mistake. <laughs> wow, that's a great answer. I've heard that one. <laughs> no, honestly, it was uh, it was by chance, probably not by not by mistake, to be honest. But mm -hmm. I like to say by mistake. My my background is in entrepreneurship, so I started my first company when I was nineteen. And to be honest with you, when I was doing that, the word entrepreneur and the word startup didn't even exist. And if they existed, they were essentially synonyms for unemployed people or unemployable people. So <laughs> you can imagine how long this was. Uh, but with time, um, there is more attention now being put on entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial activities and startups. And uh, as I said, I had my first company, then I worked with other people's startups. I worked with accelerator programs. Hmm. And then at one point I was um, trying to, and this is, this is, the actual story. I was trying to to get a job 
and I was writing my CV for for an, an application, and I realized that the only way to get a job is to stand out at the CV round and then mm. get invited to the interview because the job to be done concept, right, applied to job hunting essentially means that the CV's job is to get you to that interview. And then what's happening in the interview is going to be up to you. So applying this concept, I decided to do something very radical, a very radically different CV than would be normally accepted by, by organizations. So I created something super radical design-wise, and I said, in the good spirit of startups, let's A-B test this, because I thought that the persona to buy this job to be done of my, yeah. my CV was uh, somebody that is doing recruitment, but is doing recruitment for startups or for scale-ups. So what I've done, I sent my CV, and I kid you not, to the first two job openings I've seen on a platform, one for a startup and one for a corporation. There you go. And, uh -huh. and uh, guess what? I've learned exactly nothing from my experiment because both of them contacted me for an interview. I said, okay, so this A-B test definitely failed, <laughs> <laughs> right? Because there was no way for me to know if, yeah. if, if one persona converts better than another persona. Basically, I went, I went to, to the interview and I decided to stay with, uh, with the corporation while mm. there. I wanted to quit after exactly three weeks because I said, guys, the way you're building products in this company is just backwards. And uh, I think that's when I started blogging, speaking at conferences, organizing events around uh, corporate innovation, the ways, the ways corporations should change in order to accommodate in innovators and innovation within, within their yeah. uh, within their established organizations. And that's how I met my co-authors. And you actually had Esther speak at your podcast a couple right. of months ago. Yeah. So the rest is history, I'd say. Wow. I had never heard anybody talk about a CV. It's brilliant in the, in the lens of a job to be done. And it's, that is, it's really, that's awesome thinking. I like that. When I was teaching at the university, I was teaching my students to think like that because uh, yeah. a lot of people come to, come to the CV by saying, oh, the CV is going to get me the job. No, the, the, the CV won't get you the job. You're going to get yourself the job. The job of the CV is to put you in a position for you to get the job. Yeah, absolutely. Or to advertise yourself, to present your expertise. So yeah. I was essentially eating my own dog food. As I said, I come from the startup background. So I was applying it to what I was doing, essentially job <laughs> yeah. hunting. That's cool. That's cool. And you use, you know, let, let's talk about the word innovation. What does that mean? It's your, you know, that's, a, that's a tough one to define sometimes. Uh, I don't don't ask for a definition from me. I think every organization needs to have their own definition of innovation, yeah. because what's what's innovation for an organization that started yesterday? Take for example a Challenger Bank. What's what's their definition of innovation is definitely going to be a different for an established bank. Yeah. Right. And again, they are both banks. They are both in the same industry, but they will define things differently. What's innovation for somebody in automotive is going to be different from what's innovation for someone yeah. in, in pharma. Uh, in general, I say that, and again, for the listeners that read the corporate startup, we like to say that it's something new wrapped in a, uh, in a sustainable business model. Again, um, I, I would encourage everybody to come up with their own definition. And there's many organizations from which you can draw inspiration. There is this book that came out, I think, a year ago called Eat, Sleep, Innovate, Good friend of ours, Paul Coban and I, Scott Anthony. I haven't read it. Yeah, I'll look. Yeah, for check it, it out. Check it out. Uh, Paul actually works at, uh, at the DBS in Singapore. This 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 digital bank in Singapore, mm. and in the book they actually have a very clear definition of what innovation means for DBS. Uh -huh. So yeah. if you need inspiration, by all means, pick up that book or even reach out to to Paul, and I'm sure he can he can share it with you. Okay. Yeah, I think that's awesome that, that you say. You know. It, it doesn't matter what the definition of innovation is. It matters what the definition is for you, right? I think yeah, that's, it's, it's, it's very important. Yeah. It's overlooked. A lot of companies start doing innovation without agreeing internally on what innovation is. Exactly. Um, exactly. It, it doesn't need to be dogmatic. It doesn't need to be by the book. Forget right. the books that you read. But what's important is to have one and to consider the fact that innovation means that you're building something with purpose. Yeah, yeah. I love that answer. Well, how did you, you know, you mentioned the corporate startup, and I think it's a fantastic book, and I, I've, I've read it. How did that come to be? 
I was essentially documenting my my learnings with with that company that I told you I got the job with and uh, blogging about the things that we were doing, encountering problems that I had, solutions that I found. Uh, and along the way, speaking at the conference, I think it was in Manchester, I've met Tendai, my, my co-author, and then you know, we started exchanging notes. We decided to write a thing together. And then he pulled in Esther, and uh, this, was the, this was the team. It took us about three, four years to write the, write the thing because uh, essentially everything that's there has been tried by at least one of us. Okay. It's not okay. all free. So we know that we stand behind our words. Let's put this yeah, way. yeah, right, right. Did you find yourselves kind of each in a, a different perspective corner? Or was there a lot of alignment in the ways the companies you were working with and the spaces you were touching? I think there was a lot of alignment on uh, the principles behind it, less so on the tactics. And the tactics was obviously were obviously dictated by the circumstances that we were facing. Uh, at that time, uh, Tendai was, uh, was working a lot in publishing and in education. I was in telecommunication. I have no clue what Esther was doing back then. So uh, again, totally different perspectives, different yeah. environments, different countries, different cultures. This is why I said like we agreed on, on the principles behind the book. Yeah. I like how you started this whole podcast when you were mentioning the company, the corporate company that you joined just wasn't innovating in a good way. And when you think about the need for companies to get startup thinking and a startup type of, of, of innovation going, I mean, why do companies need to do that? You know, it's like with the definition of innovation, everybody has to have their own reason and everybody has their own reason. They don't have to have it. They actually have their own reason. Yeah. Some people do it because they want to increase the top line. Some, some companies do it because they want to do bottom line efficiencies. Some companies do it because of fear of disruption. Some people want to do it because of the need of, of, of diversifying portfolio. Some people might even do it because uh, they want to build a different organizational culture and they go to innovation in order to enable that culture to you know grow. Yeah. Some people, and again, they should not be ashamed of it. Some people just do it for marketing. Yeah, it's just really good marketing. Is it uh -huh. worth investing in innovation for marketing? Are you, what's what's the return on that dollar invested? That's another conversation altogether. But uh, I think every company has their own reason. Yeah, yeah. Did you find it companies struggle getting started? What what are the barriers if a company's you know they know they want to get into it they haven't really been into it they've been doing core innovation you know, maybe they're very successful at, at the products they've had but they say let's say they want to be uh want to try to generate some disruptive products right something new and they just can't do it the way they've been doing innovation they know they have to do it differently what barriers do they face in terms of trying to get going there's a couple of things here we can we can discuss about first of all yeah i i, I can answer your question about about barriers and blockers Another thing we can we can discuss about is the fact that, in my opinion, in our opinion, at, at outcome, we believe that organizations should not pursue radical innovation. Okay. What do I mean by radical innovation? I mean high multiples, high return multiples. Okay. Yeah. You are just not set up as an organization to do that. Look at the VCs. Look at the VC world. Probably. Looking at the data, you're going to see that around 65% of the investments return in between zero and one X. Yeah, right. 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 So you're going to lose essentially half of your money by just investing in innovation. Again, funds don't live off unicorns. If you were to have a VC, and any, any VC would tell you that, that they were not successful because they invested in Airbnb. They were successful because they invested in a hundred other startups that nobody has any clue what they're called, yeah. but they return a good and consistent 5x, 10x, 7x, 3x. Yeah. For, forget forget the, the 20, 50x thing, because first of all, you are not set up as an organization to do that. Yeah, you don't have okay. the governance. You don't have the people. You don't have the culture. You don't have the motivation to do it. People don't have the motivation to, to pursue endeavors like those. So not even VCs are, are doing it. Why would you want to do it when right, you have a, right. a poor business to run on top? If you want to read more about it, I, I put an article out. It's called Stop Chasing Unicorns. Uh, it's on the We Are Outcome blog. Right. We'll make sure we link to it. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. It's a very short article ex explaining why 
you should do innovation, but you should be pragmatic about your investment and investment yeah. strategy in innovation. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of blockers, again, I'm not trying to give a politically correct answer here, but it really depends from company to company and from industry to industry. Some industries are more prone to being conservative in terms of decision making and in terms of risk taking. Some industries might have issues around process and governance. Actually, we mapped out, you know, the blockers for every industry. So if, if the audience wants to go to uh, innovationmaturityindex.info uh, or type in, in Google Innovation Maturity Index, they can download free Fantastic. reports on innovation blockers across 11 industries. So yeah. you're going to see what are the blockers from, from every industry. Super. I would say, uh, knowing the data, most issues are around uh, leadership and leading for innovation and around governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are the main recurring topics. But yeah. uh, again, I'm not saying that everybody figured out strategy. I'm not saying that everybody figured out whatever culture. It's just that in general, what's holding people back is either governance or leadership Yeah, in general. Yeah. Right. I've, I've heard similar things in the companies I've spoken with. Well, you know, as you're talking in my back of my brain, I'm thinking, okay, uh, there's a natural extension of this then to, you know, how, how do you measure it and how do you understand even if, if it's working for you or if it's not working for you, which I think is, is one of the things you've tackled as well, right? Yeah, I mean, this is why we uh, we put up uh, the second book, Innovation Accounting. Uh, actually, in all fairness, Innovation Accounting was something that they always wanted to write. But I think we had to write the corporate startup first before before even considering Innovation Accounting. I think that uh, when, when the corporate startup came out, we were not mature enough and the industry was not mature enough. So there was no, essential, essentially, there was no data around how to measure mm -hmm. innovation and no experience on that. It's very important to have an innovation accounting system, but uh, in all fairness, uh, that innovation accounting system needs to be linked with a mature organization. If you haven't done innovation and you're just getting started now, no point in even buying the innovation accounting book. It won't help yeah. you. Right. No point in even considering innovation accounting, like essentially measurements for innovation, because there's no innovation happening at the moment. Just go ahead, throw yourself in the water, start swimming, try one lap, and then we're going to see if you actually need innovation accounting and what, <laughs> would, what will that innovation accounting system look, look for you? Yeah. You know, if you think of kind of the accounting, the, the, in, the typical innovation metrics for the non-startup uh, type of thinking, you know, I've, I've got products out there and I just want to continue to extend them. And, 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 and this is maybe, maybe one type of innovation, maybe more sure innovation or more, more known innovation. I, I've watched so many companies even there just overload the metrics, right? I mean, they just put way too many in. They measure way, they track way too much stuff. They measure less and, and, and nobody looks at the data. Uh, have you seen that? And in, I'm thinking of the realm of the innovation accounting book. Definitely I've seen organizations that are trying to measure a lot of things. I always keep saying that if, a metric won't lead to behavior change. Don't bother, you know, measuring yeah. it. Like, right. what, what's the point of measuring my calories if I'm not going to go on a diet or if I'm not going to exercise? Yeah. What's, what's the point, right? Just to have another metric to look at? I have better Correct. things to look at. I mean, Netflix is full of great movies, so I'd rather just, just watch a movie than, than track something <laughs> I'm not interested in. Yeah. Same, same goes for innovation. Just... And same goes for product development. Everybody that's, that's been in product development, and again, my background is in product, so I know how important metrics are when you're trying to build a product. Everybody that has been in product can tell you that metrics are useless if you're not following up with action. Yeah, same goes for the innovation right. system. It, what's, what's the point of measuring the learning velocity of a certain team or of a certain unit if you don't have any way or if you haven't thought about any ways to improve that later on or if you don't have a very good capability development program that allows people to improve their skill to drive that metric higher yeah, right what's what's the point focus on stuff that you know people will take action on and uh, things that will drive behavior change 
Yeah. I, I like the way you presented it in your innovation accounting book. It's there's a there's a simplicity to it, but there's a thoroughness to it, right? There's both yes. sides of it. Yeah. So I just really thought that was well written. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Just to slightly switch topics, I'd love to hear your thoughts on ecosystems and innovation and, you know, where that stands is, is, uh, are you seeing a lot of it or is it something that's emerging? Where would you rank that? Uh, It's a, it's a good topic. I think a lot of companies are trying to make an ecosystem play. I would say the vast majority of companies are either having this as uh, something that they wish to do yeah. or they dream about doing. But in all fairness, only a handful of companies are actually doing it mm-hmm. and doing it well. Everybody likes to think of them doing it or likes to think of them in the future being able to do it. I think, again, it requires a high level of maturity from an organization to be able to build and do an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's much like platforms, right? Like platforms was another big buzzword a couple of years back, right? Yeah. And I think ecosystem is kind of like getting there as well. Right. First of all, you have to build a good product. Then you need to be able to have that as a repeatable process and to have a good innovation process within your organization before you even consider an ecosystem play. I, I wouldn't say... First thing you do, you build an ecosystem. Look, look, at, look at Apple, right? The company that's doing the ecosystem thing pretty well. First, they build a great product, and then they branch to do an ecosystem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can't say that tomorrow you're going to create an ecosystem of oh, third gosh. parties that are going to build stuff for you, and you're a chemical company that hasn't even had an open innovation session with a startup because you're too afraid for IP and whatever rights. Yeah, so I guess the message is don't just jump in and think you can do it, right? Yeah, you need you need to have experience. And to be honest with you, I think the organizations that are doing it the best are the ones that talk less about it. <laughs> there is kind of like this reverse relationship, reverse metric. The more yeah. you talk, the less you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you see it growing? Do you see that, uh, okay, there's there's few doing it now very well. A lot of people have it as a as a as a goal, right, to get to somewhere. Do you think it's growing, or do you think it'll always be just a small slice of 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 companies that are going to do it? Uh, in my opinion, it should be growing because there's a lot of benefits to ecosystems. And again, I don't even want to go into the detail of what are the benefits. Again, everybody should define their own benefits, and again, it really depends from industry to industry. But there's obviously a lot of benefits of playing in an ecosystem and having an ecosystem play. But again, how many of the industries are designed or are capable of doing that? How many companies are able to build this? Only time will tell. But I think it should grow. And I think we're going to see more of that happening. Mm -hmm. The problem with ecosystems, in my opinion, is that in an industry, and again, I might be wrong, it's going to be a winner takes it all type of play. If you're able to do it right, you are going to blow the competition out of okay. the water pretty fast. Yeah. And again, we see it with retail, right? Amazon has a great ecosystem. Look at what's happening with other retail vendors, right? Look at yeah, what's happening right. with Walmart, with Marks and Spencers, with others, right? They're they're definitely getting hit. Again, save goes for for apps, right? We have an oligopoly here. We have Apple App Store and, App Store, the, yeah. and the Play Store from Google. That's, yeah, that's, that's it. it. That's <laughs> it. That's it, right? Yeah. I mean, if, yeah. you are, if you're an app developer, you either develop for one or the other or both. But then yeah. again, the options are very limited. Yeah. It's amazing. I had a conversation with somebody very recently who had the idea of, of making a store. And I thought, are you crazy? You know, are you crazy? Why, why, why would, you know, the, the odds of success when there's the two mega stores out there are so, so low. But anyway, it was a, just a side conversation. I think it, it came and went in a matter of about five minutes. <laughs> oh, I, I think in some industries it makes sense because consumers are taking a different stance on, on consumption. Yeah. Take, for example, the fashion industry. In, 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 in fashion, a lot of people are now moving away from fast fashion, moving into slow fashion, where opening a store and, uh, you know, getting connected with your audience on a personal level 
it's actually a competitive advantage over mm, over yeah. Zara, over H and M, over other fast fashion um, sure. brands. Yeah, and there may be some new store we can't even think of, like an energy store, or who who knows in the future, right? Something sure. that isn't gonna it's it's got nothing to do with with Apple and 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 uh, Google, right? And Android and the whole ecosystem there. So we we had a lot of topics here. This was really great. I appreciate that. When you walk into a company, I know you're probably working with little companies. I mean, if somebody said, give me one piece of advice, is there such a thing? I mean, what would you say to somebody? Who is asking, like, what's the, yeah, what's their, what's their job role? What's this? Aha. Uh-huh. So, so let's say they are, it's not a CEO. It's not a C level, right? It's somebody who's maybe a director or somebody in R and D who's saying, you know, we, we, we need to do better. And maybe they're challenged with how to sell up, right? They're not getting maybe support from above. Well, what would you say to them? I would say try with numbers. Try with yeah. Uh, try with yeah. Try with concrete data. Don't go necessarily for hearts and minds. However, don't go and predict the world is going to end if people won't innovate. Like mm-hmm. I hate that fear mongering. Yeah, world is going to end if we don't innovate. Be be pragmatic and be down to earth. Be pragmatic, I think, will be the first advice. Yeah. Uh, if you invest in innovation, make sure that you treat it as a business discipline, as a management discipline, meaning that you have to do it with the same rigor you do other management disciplines, like finance, like product, like all the other management disciplines out there. Yeah, yeah. Makes a lot of sense. I think you could get a lot of attention with, with facts and, and, and data to help move your cause forward. Yeah. Totally. And again, don't, don't try to sell the sky in the pie. Be reasonable in terms mm-hmm. of expectations management and be yeah. reasonable in terms of what you promise you are going to deliver. Yeah. Don't sell, we're going to build an Airbnb every year because honestly, you <laughs> won't. None of the top VCs invest in an Airbnb every year. What makes you think that you're going to be smarter than them? And <laughs> if you are smarter than them, by all means, leave your job because you are underpaid. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> if you have the ability to spot unicorns and to build unicorns once a year, dude, just leave the company. You're going to become a billionaire by Christmas. Yeah, right. And we know the odds. <laughs> Pretty yeah, low. Exactly, exactly. But hey, who knows? Who knows? Maybe the person I'm talking to is very confident. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe somebody listening is, is there. Yeah, you bet. You bet. You wouldn't want to discourage it. Of course. Just reach for your dream. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 Dan, what are you working on now that's exciting? I mean, a couple of books underneath the, the belt and some great companies that you're working with. And you're, I know you're out there uh, presenting and speaking and, and, yeah, there's, there's there's a couple of things we're uh, we're working on. One of the thing that obviously is taking a lot of uh, a lot of time is uh, we're trying to codify innovation accounting into a software. We already have a an MVP out. Uh, we're trying to do things a bit different than than others are in the in the space. I don't want to go into detail of that, but mm-hmm. if people are interested, there's a landing page. The software is called Satori. So you can find it under satori.weareoutcome.co. Mm-hmm. That's one. And the other thing is that uh, I'm very keen on finding a way for people to create goals for innovation. Coming mm. from the innovation accounting, yeah. but uh, essentially helping organizations create and set themselves some goals for innovation. It's one thing to say, hey, to your CEO, I need a hundred million to invest in innovation. It's another thing to say I need a hundred million to achieve X, Y, Z. Yeah, and be pragmatic again about those those X, Y, Z targets. This is th- th- these are the two things that uh, that we're kind of working working yeah. on. I think we have yeah. a good idea what we're doing, but um, yeah, in time we're going to start pushing content out, explaining our thinking around it, and yeah. hopefully some case examples as well. Yeah, I I think the idea of of, of helping people. Learn how to how to create those goals, how to set those goals. What are reasonable goals? I think it's a great one. I think uh, I don't know if that's that's a book or that's consulting or that's uh, that's broad. Uh, it's going to be there's going to be some but... articles probably and some presentations yeah. and obviously yeah. some consulting because uh, we usually don't write about stuff unless we've done it. 
Yeah. And the power of a case example is the power of a case example. Yeah, yeah for sure. And I, I just, to me, that resonates well, especially thinking about all the companies that I work with. I wish you a lot of luck on that because I think that's really important. I think creating good goals around innovation uh, is 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 important, and I think uh, I think we all need help on that. So I'm hoping you're really successful. <laughs> sure, <Yeah>. thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, hey Dan, this has been a fun conversation. I really appreciate you joining us. Any last minute thoughts you want to leave with uh, with the listeners before we uh, we we close up? I would just say, just uh, you know, stay curious and 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 stay humble. Probably curious more than humble, but definitely stay curious. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really appreciate that that advice. Great advice. Okay, well, hey Dan, thanks for joining us. Really enjoyed chat. My pleasure. Keep in touch, and let's talk again sometime. Especially as you make progress on those new endeavors that you're taking on, I'd love to love to hear how that goes. Maybe check in later this year and see how it's coming along. A hundred percent. Thank you very much for having me on the show. And to all our listeners, thank you for joining us. Really glad you did. I hope you found that as enjoyable as I did. And uh, obviously we'll have, as always, we put things in the show notes uh, so you can kind of connect back to Dan and, and keep track of the things that, that he and his company is working on. And wish you all a great week ahead. Thanks for joining us and bye for now. Thanks for joining us this week for Innovation Talks with Paul Heller. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, or wherever you listen to podcasts. For additional information on today's topic, check out sophion.com, S-O-P-H-E-O-N.com, where you will find plenty of innovation-centric content and corporate best practices. If you'd like to discuss anything with Paul or would like to get in touch with the show, email us at talks at sophion.com.